And the passage for today is James chapter 5. Just turn to the very end. Verse 12 through 20. So let me read those for us now as we're all getting on the same page. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death, and will cover a multitude of sins. Father, I just pray that you would be with us now as I seek to open your word and Holy Spirit quicken our minds and our hearts to what you have to say to us this morning. Amen. Okay, James is wrapping up his letter. As we have seen, he has a tendency to jump around from topic to topic, much more so than Paul does. And when we read James' conclusion to his letter, we see that here's a pastor who loves his people very much, He's talking about what he's seen, what he's learned about pastoring the flock of Jesus Christ. In this passage for today, James discusses three things he spent quite a bit of time talking about in the rest of the letter. The first section is how Christians should speak. That's verse 12. The second section, which is where we're going to spend most of our time this morning, deals with how we should pray. That's going to be verses 13 through 18. James mentions four kinds of prayer, and we'll look at those. In particular, we'll see why verse 15 seems to say that prayer will save one who is sick, when all of us have prayed for sick people who did not recover. Then the third section is verses 19 and 20, about how Christians should live with and love each other. Now, if there's one thing I hope we're all going to walk away with today, it's that the Bible's promises of answers to prayer must always be understood within the context of God's will. Okay. So these are the three things we'll talk about this morning. One, the way Christians should speak to each other. Two, the way, yeah, the way Christians should pray to each other. And three, the way Christians should love each other. So, number one, the way Christians should speak, Christians, to sum it up, should speak in the simple, plain truth that honors God. Let me read verse 12. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall into condemnation. Now, why does James say, but above all? Does he mean this is the most important thing he's saying in the entire letter? Not necessarily. This was a popular form for bringing a letter to its conclusion in first century Greco-Roman culture. For instance, I might be writing a letter to a good friend, just talking about various things, you know, how soon the kids and the grandkids are doing, what I'm reading these days. And when I was wrapping things up, I would write something like, but above all, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the spring, something like that. It was just a literary convention that James is using. But being careful in how we speak is something James has talked about before. Chapter 5, verse 9, he said, don't grumble against each other. And in chapter 3, of course, he spends the first 12 verses, a very famous passage, warning us about the power of the tongue, pleading with us, please be careful what you say. So what we have here in verse 12 is James saying, now let me just leave you with this, okay? When you speak, don't take an oath. 
means don't swear. Either by heaven or earth, just say yes or no and let it go at that. Now, actually, this is one of the rare times in the book of James where Jesus Christ is referred to. Some of you may have noticed that Jesus is not mentioned much in the book of James. But in the Sermon on the Mount, there's a parallel passage to verse 12. It's in Matthew 5, 34 to 37, where Jesus says, But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair black or white. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. As you can see, James' wording in verse 12 is remarkably close to those words of Jesus himself. Now remember that James is the half-brother of Jesus, not either of the Jameses who are apostles with Jesus for th three years. Those were James, the brother of John, and the other James we don't hear about too much, which in church history we call him James the Less. How'd you like to have that nickname in the group? Some come, some come, come like, me, oh, are you a James, a disciple of Jesus Christ? Why, well, yes, I am. Are you James the Porton or James the Less? Well, actually, I'm James the Less. Oh, where's James Moore? Oh, he's over there signing autographs. No, the James who's writing this letter is the third James. <laughs> they must not have had many names back then. This is the third James, the leader of the Jerusalem church. It appears he only came to faith that his half-brother Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, after Jesus' resurrection. But he's clearly immersed himself in his half-brother's teaching, whether the words of Jesus had already been written down somewhere or whether he heard them from Jesus' disciples. Okay, so what does it mean by an oath, and why is that such a big deal? Well, taking an oath was what one commentator has described as Verbal confirmations guaranteed by an appeal to divine witness. In other words, somebody at work comes, comes up to you, says, did you eat that tuna fish sandwich that I put in the refrigerator in the break room this morning? Me? No, of course not. It looks like they don't believe you, especially since you've got a little tuna salad on your shirt. So you say, for heaven's sake, no, as God is my witness, I didn't eat your sandwich. May God strike me dead if I did. That's taking an oath. You're appealing to a divine witness to back up what you're saying. Remember, as kids, we used to do this all the time. Mom, no, I didn't hear you calling me, really. Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a, there you go, stick a needle in my eye. One of the stories that my mother loved to tell, especially to Sue and my kids, was one time when I was, you know, about, I don't know, yeah, 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 she was calling me and calling me, and I didn't come in, and finally I came in. And Mom said, where were you? Didn't you hear me calling you? And evidently, I said, no, I didn't hear you the first two times you called me. <laughs> so. Now, it was not just James or early Christians who were opposed to taking an oath. Ancient Greek philosophers counseled against taking an oath. Epictetus, Pythagoras, forbade their followers completely from taking oaths, because what James is saying is, if somebody asks you, did you eat my tuna fish sandwich, they should be able to trust your simple yes or no. Because usually people invoke an oath to their truthfulness when they're really lying. And that's most likely what James has in mind here in verse 12. He's seen his fellow Christians trying to get away with a lie or half-truth by swearing to God they're telling the truth. Did you eat my tuna fish sandwich? No. I don't believe you. Uh, look, I swear on the stack of Bibles. I swear on my mother's grave that I did not eat your tuna fish sandwich. Well, okay, I guess I believe you. I would hope so. Next time, chop some, chop some walnuts in. For anybody, but much more for Christians, people should be able to believe you if you just say yes or no. Okay. Verse 12 says you may fall under condemnation for doing this. Now, some of you might say, well, doesn't the Apostle Paul do this? And you'd be right. Yes he, yes, he does. Paul frequently takes an oath to prove the truth of what he's saying. In Romans 1.9, he says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, 
that without ceasing, I mention you always in my prayers. Well, that's the textbook definition of taking an oath. In Philippians 1.8, Paul says, For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. There are many other examples we could give. Now, nobody's doubting that Paul is telling the truth here. Everyone understands that, of course, they can trust what Paul says. He just wants to really strongly emphasize how much he yearns to see his friends at Philippi. How true is what he's writing. So, here's what we conclude from this. If you're the Apostle Paul, <laughs> okay, if you're writing Holy Scripture under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then you can take an oath. If you're not, don't. It's best to be known as a person whose simple yes or no is as good as gold. Okay, that was part one. That was the easy one. Part two, the way Christians should pray. In good times and in bad times. Pray according to the will of God and faith. In verses 7 through 12, which we looked at last time, there were seven references to patience, steadfastness, and waiting. Here in verses 13 through 18, we have seven references to prayer. Obviously, prayer is the theme of this chunk of Scripture. There are four kinds of prayer shown in this passage. Number one, in verse 13, we see praying individuals. Number two, verses 14 to 15, we see the elders praying. Three, in verse 16, we see praying Christian brothers and sisters. And four, verses 16 to 18, we see the praying prophet. So let's take these in order. Number one, the praying individual. Verse 13, excuse me, verse 13. Here, let me read it. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Well, that's easy enough to understand, isn't it? The Holy Spirit is here encouraging us to pray during times of suffering and during times of joy. Is that what we actually do? Of course, we expect people to pray in times of danger, times of need, and times of suffering. That's what the old saying, there are no atheists in foxholes, means, isn't it? When people are suffering in places of danger, a few bullets flying around your head, you're going to be praying, even though you never pray at any other time. But do you find that you only pray when things are tough? Or when you need something from God? How often do you pray in joy, as uh, Jason reminded us, just thanking God for answers to prayer? Or because you just want to share your joy with your Heavenly Father? As John Calvin said, verse 13 means there is no time in which God does not invite us to come to himself. In Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10, they say, where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. What he's saying is, no matter where you are, God's there. God's with you. Here in verse 13, James invites us to pray to God no matter where we find ourselves or what condition we find ourselves in. After all, he's right there with you anyway, so you might as well pray to him. As Oswald Chambers wrote, if God has made your cup sweet, drink it with grace. If he has made your cup bitter, drink it in communion with him. Okay. Now let's look a little bit closer. James says, verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. So what should you be praying for when you're suffering? Do you pray for suffering to end? I mean, I have once or twice, twice maybe. That's natural, I suppose. Many of our prayers are, in fact, for some kind of suffering to end, but James actually has already told you what to pray in suffering. Look back at James chapter 1, verses 2 through 6. James writes, 
Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, that means suffering, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. Now, friends, if you're suffering, you should be praying. You should be praying your head off. We should be wearing holes in the knees of our jeans, praying during times of pain, loss, darkness, or confusion, praying that we may have the wisdom, the strength, to build steadfastness, to endure the suffering, to learn what it is God wants us to learn, that we may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, and if we don't have that sense, we need to continue praying. We are to have the faith that God wants to answer that prayer and that he will answer that prayer. So in good times of cheer come, good times are here again, we can share that with our Heavenly Father as well. Because all good things come from him, so thank him for the good times. How often do we do that? Thank him for the joy that is ours in Christ. It's good to keep doing that again, as Jason reminded us this morning, to keep reminding ourselves of where all the good in our lives comes from, isn't it? There's a striking illustration from the life of Charles Spurgeon. Who's heard of Charles Spurgeon? Spurgeon? Probably the most well-known preacher in 19th century England, speaking about prayer during suffering. And he was a man who had terrible physical suffering. He wrote, I found it a blessing in my own experience to plead with God that I am his child. Some months ago, when I was suffering with, with an extreme pain, so bad that I could not bear it without crying out, I asked everyone to go out from my room. Leave me alone. Then I had nothing I could say to God but this, you are my father and I am your child. And you, as a father, are gentle and full of mercy I cannot bear my child to suffer as you make me suffer. And if I saw him tormented as I am now, I would do what I could to help him and put my arms under him to sustain him. Will you hide your face from me, my father? Will you still lay in me your heavy hand and not give to me your smile? If he be a father, let him show himself a father. That's what I prayed, Spurgeon continued. And when those who cared for me came back, I had courage to tell them that I shall never have such agony again from this moment, for God has heard my prayer. I bless God that relief came and that most terrible pain never returned. Faith mastered it by laying hold upon God in his own revealed character, the character in which only in our darkest hour are we best able to appreciate him. That's a perfect sign of the praying individual. Number two, verses 14 to 15, we have the praying elders. Let me read those verses. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Okay, there's a couple things to go through here. You might have already noticed. <laughs> First, about healing. Now, the elders of this church, see you and myself, we do not hold to the charismatic position that says the miraculous sign gifts of the Holy Spirit are continuing today. In other words, we don't think there's anybody running, or running around who has a gift of healing. Now, we do believe strongly and fervently that the Lord heals miraculously and answers to prayer every single day. Day. Amen, brother. The Lord heals miraculously in answer to prayer every single day, every single hour in this world. Anyone can pray for healing for themselves or for others, and the Lord may be pleased to honor that request in answer to prayer. To quote R.C. Sproul, yes, prayer does change things. 
I am as firmly convinced as I am about anything that God is miraculously healing people in answer to prayer every hour, sometimes working through doctors, through medical science, other times through other means. To me, it's patently obvious that there is so much healing that happens in the world that would not happen if people did not pray for it to happen. God answers those prayers. And anyone, any believer in Christ, can pray those prayers of faith. Let me read verse 14 again. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, and we're happy to do that. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, there are two words. <laughs> there are two little words in verses 14 and 15 which complicate a straightforward English reading of this text. Two little Greek words that have somewhat different meanings depending on how they're used. The first one, in verse 14, is a Greek word translated sick. In Greek, that's asthenine. Okay? That word can mean just being physically sick. It's used that way in the Gospels. In uh, John chapter 4, when it says Jesus came to Cana and an official met him whose son was sick, it says his son was asthenine at the point of death. Okay, that's obviously physical sickness. No question there. Asthenine is also used in the New Testament to mean weak. To have a weak faith. To have a weak conscience. In Acts 20, 35, Paul says those who are asthenine in faith. <coughs> that's not physically ill, that's talking about being weak. Same word. So the question is, does asinine here in James 5, verse 14, mean to be physically ill, or does it mean just to be weak? You never have perfect unanimity about everything, as you know, but most good conservative evangelical scholars I read agree with me. They take it as being physical sickness. Verse 14 says, if anyone's asinine, let them call the elders to come and pray over them. Now, we can tell that we're talking about a very, very sick, not somebody who has a cold, we have a very, very sick person. They're so ill, they can't even come to church. They have to have someone call the elders to come to their bedside. We're talking a, a serious, almost deathly physical illness here, okay? In that situation, the elders are instructed to anoint the ill person with olive oil and to pray for them. Now, it's not the anointing that does anything. It's a prayer of faith that's doing the work. I mean, the oil is just symbolic. It has no magic power of its own. You know, it doesn't matter if you put a little bit of you know, olive oil on a person or if you, you know, really. It's not in the oil. It's in the prayer of faith. Now, now let's read verse 15. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Okay, this says the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And here's that second little Greek word. <laughs> That's a little tricky to translate. The word save is the Greek word sozo. Sometimes it means to be saved physically, as in a sick person being healed. But in the New Testament especially when combined with faith, as here, it often means to be saved in a spiritual sense. Okay, without boring you with Greek exegesis, let's put all this together and let's see what we have. Now, the Bible does not, does not, N-O-T, does not teach that all sickness is the result of sin. If anyone's told you that, they're wrong. It does teach that some sickness is a result of sin. 1 Corinthians 11, 29 to 30. Paul's talking about taking communion. He says, For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak, asthenine, and ill, and some have died. There's a verse you don't hear preached on too often. Evidently, then, some quite serious physical illness can be brought on, at least in part, by spiritual causes. And I think that's what's going on here in verses 14 and 15. 
it's my sense of verses 14 and 15 that they're talking about people who are physically quite ill and who realize through the illness that there's something they need to get right with God. Maybe their sickness is caused by guilt over past sin. Maybe it's a direct result of sin. But they are aware that there is at least a spiritual component to what they're physically suffering. So they call for the elders to come pray over them as they pray themselves. Now, for a confession and forgiveness, or for God to save them, this is what the elders are praying for as well, that the person will be confessing sin, the Lord will be merciful, the Lord will be forgiving, and the physical symptoms will be healed as well as a spiritual issue. The elders see the MSI, we can never pray anyone into salvation. That doesn't happen. Okay. But that seems to be what makes the most sense of this passage. It is not saying elders can walk into a room, pray for a near-death sick person, and raise them up to health. I'd love it if I could, but I can't do that. Because it's abundantly clear that that simply doesn't happen in the church. So therefore, the Bible can't be saying it does happen, always happen, if we don't see it happening. So what we need to discern is what the Bible is saying does happen. And to me, verses 14 to 15 are talking about people who are dangerously sick, who have been convicted that the illness is at least partly due to their sin, who know they must get right with God, confess their sin, are saved, whether receiving salvation for the first time or forgiveness for that particular sin, under the help and direction of the elders of the local church. So, there you go. 2,000 years of controversy solved. Now, the third kind of prayer we see is prayer of and for our Christian brothers and sisters. Let me read verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Friends, confession of sin can bring great healing, spiritually and physically. Having other Christians then pray for us to accept God's forgiveness, which he's promised to give, is a tremendously effective way of dealing with guilt. And this is essential because sooner or later, guilt takes it out on the body. You knew that, right? Guilt actually physically affects you. Come on, even WebMD knows this. I looked it up yesterday. And it says, guilt often brings a host of symptoms. Some of the physical symptoms of guilt are problems with sleep, your stomach, digestion, and muscle tension. I once heard Tim Keller say he was talking to a highly regarded New York City physician who told him one day, Tim, do you know what psychosomatic illness is? Tim said, yeah, sure, that's when you have a, you think you have a disease, but you don't really have it. And the physician said, no, 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 not at all, Tim. He said, it's real. There is real pain in the gut or the leg or the head or wherever, it's just that there's no obvious physical cause for it. Well, the Bible is clear that unconfessed sin, guilt, can and do cause physical illness in people. In 2021, a study was done in the Czech Republic, and I found this on the American National Institute of Health website, finding that people with higher feelings of guilt, not shame, guilt, there is a difference, guilt were more likely to suffer from chronic disease. The study found guilt associated with higher, higher levels of arthritis, back pain, cardiovascular disease, asthma, cancer, depression, and anxiety. Let me quote directly from the study's abstract. The association was strongest in the case of cancer. Our findings suggest that feelings of guilt are associated with worse physical health. Confessing sin, then praying with and for our Christian brothers and sisters for healing isn't, is not just good for the soul, it's good for the body. Number four, the fourth kind of prayer we see here is a praying prophet. This is verses 16 through 18. Elijah is given as an example of someone James's audience who are primarily Jewish Christians would have been very familiar with. 
Remember, in the last section, we saw James use Job as an example of suffering. In this section, he uses Elijah as an example of the power of prayer. Let me read verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. James makes a point, he doesn't want you to miss this, that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He wasn't some superhuman being, okay? And look what he did. He prayed that it would not rain, and it did not rain for three years. Now, I don't think me, you, or anyone right now can pray that it's not going to rain for three years and then it does rain for three years. That's, that's, that's not going to happen. We all understand Elijah was a normal human being. Okay, we, we get that. He wasn't perfect. His faith was up and down like ours is. He got tired. He got depressed. He got hungry. We get that. But to say we can do what Elijah did because he had a nature like ours is to grossly misread verse 17. That would be like me saying, oh, you want to form a rock band? You want to do what the Beatles did? Well, sure, you, you, you both have a human nature. I'm sure you'll be able to do it. You want to write plays and poetry like William Shakespeare? Well, you're human. He's human. I'm sure you can do it. No, you're not Elijah. You're not a miracle worker, and that's the whole point. Elijah was not a miracle worker either. God is the only miracle worker. Sometimes he chooses to use humans to work the miracles. Elijah's prayers were powerful because, as 1 Kings 17 clearly shows, he was sent by God to King Ahab with a specific message that it would not rain for three years except by the word of God. Elijah was acting in obedience with God's will. God did not come to Elijah and say, Hey, Elijah, what do you want me to do to Ahab? Just name it and I'll make it happen. No. God wanted to block the rain for three years. He wanted King Ahab to know that God did it. So he sent Elijah to tell Ahab that. Elijah could not just go to any king and pray for a three-year drought. He didn't have the power. It was only in God's will that King Ahab's land be in drought for three years that Elijah's prayer had the power to make that happen. Again, I don't want you to miss the point. It was really nothing to do with Elijah. God was not looking for a man strong and powerful enough to pray that prayer, a real prayer superstar. God had all the strength and power that was needed. All he needed Elijah to do was to obey, to be righteous. That was all he needed to unleash the full powers of heaven in his prayer. So to sum up this section on prayer then, understand that all prayer must conform to God's will. If you pray for anything outside of God's will, friend, it ain't going to happen. When you pray for a sick person to be healed, sometimes they're healed, sometimes they're not. So we might think, eh, no point in praying. What's going to happen is going to happen. God's will either way. No, God tells us to pray. It's a command. So if you pray and something happens as a result, yes, there was God's will, and it was his choice to use you to help bring it about. Section number three, the way Christians should love. This is verses 19 through 20. Our last section for this morning. In this section, we have James' last word to us. Let me read those two verses. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. You know, sometimes I feel that my job as a preacher is often to tell you what the text is not saying. <laughs> as much as what the Bible is saying. This is not saying <laughs> that if you bring back someone who's been wandering from the faith, that all your sins will be wiped out. That's not what it's saying. Anyway, that would be irrelevant to you as a Christian. If you're a Christian, all your sins are already forgiven, past, present, future. They're all, all, already forgiven. Now, what James is doing here as he brings his letter to a close, he's showing us his pastor's heart. 
His final appeal, his last request, is to please watch out for each other. Others will grow weary. Others will fall away. And when they do, you need to be there for them. Show them the way back. You might grow weary. You might fall away. And when you do, you'll need your Christian brothers and sisters to help guide you back. Not that you'll lose heaven and end up in hell. If you're saved, you've been adopted by Jesus into the family of God, and that's permanent. That's for all eternity. Nothing can, you can never lose that. But if you allow sin to grow in your life, you can lose your joy. You can live a wretchedly unfulfilled Christian life down here on earth, lose heavenly rewards in the process. At that point, your faith might as well just be fire insurance. The solution for that, James is saying, is restoration, revival, rescuing, going after the one lost sheep. Jesus did it. He expects us to do it for each other. In verse 20, when it says that someone who brings a straying, wandering sinner back to the fold will save his soul from death, that's that tricky old word sozo again, translated save, which can also mean to heal. Obviously, we can't save anyone's soul. Only God does that. We can't cover anyone's sins. When you read cover, don't think like paint covering up ugly wallpaper. Think of it like somebody covering the cost of something, paying for it, like when Christ atoned on the cross for our sin. Nobody can atone for someone else's sin. In conclusion, then, what the Bible is saying to us here is not that we can save our Christian brothers and sisters and cover their sins, but as a great commentator, Alex Motyer, said, we should act as if we can have as much concern for our straying, wandering Christian brothers and sisters as we would if we did have the power to save them. Strive for their spiritual welfare as if their eternal destiny rests with us. This is exactly what St. Augustine was meaning when he said, pray as if everything depended on God, and then act as if everything depends on you. When you see a Christian brother in sin, starting to get involved in bad things, drifting away from the gospel, from church, strive for them. Pray hard for them. Go see them. Talk to them. Because if we don't lovingly walk with our brothers and sisters to increase faith in Christ-likeness, there's no one else who will. The world's not going to do that. The world's going to cheer. I myself am feeling a bit convicted of this. Um, there was a fellow I knew at a uh, previous church. He's a Christian brother, but as I learned a few weeks ago, he's currently practicing a lifestyle that's most decidedly not Christian. He's left the church we both used to go to. He's at a new church. He's already under discipline at that church for his flagrant, unchristian lifestyle. I commend that church. I commend the people caring enough about him to strive for him like that. Nobody likes being in church discipline, but it's commanded in Scripture. And sometimes it's the only way the message gets through. I, I mean, I, I, guess I, I guess I last through a psalm about a year ago. Um, I probably wasn't close enough to him to, you know, call him up and read him the riot act. There's a level of personal trust in you to do something like that. But I knew what his temptations were. I could have kept him closer to touch with him than I did. Could have, should have. But now I'll pray much more conscientiously for this brother who is straying into dangerous sin. As we said at the beginning, and as we've seen all through this passage, the Bible's promises of answers to prayer must always be understood in the context of God's will. We've seen clearly that it's God's will for us to pray. And then to pray again. And then to keep on praying. As we honor him in speech, and as we help the sick and the weak among us, as we strive to build each other up in Christian community, we have the power because we have the Holy Spirit. Because of the gospel. Because the Son of God, Jesus Christ, came to earth and died for our sins to make us into that Christian community, that living temple. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the power of God in us. 
we can speak, pray, and love according to his will. Because God loved us that much, and in Christ we can be the family of God that we were saved to be. Let us pray. Our Father, we can never thank you enough for the book of James, for the Bible, for the gospel, for Jesus' death and resurrection, whereby we have true life. Forgive us the times we fall short. Strengthen us, we pray, as we seek to live as your people, your family, and your church in this dark world. Amen.